Oh, Dickens has a real question. Yeah, but you kind of answered that one about the drift not to the left. Yeah, and and Dickens asked it. <laughs> that's the only part. That's what's making it in. That's the intro <laughs> of the video right there. I'm telling you, that's the intro of the music. Thumbnail. <laughs> <laughs> Spencer J. Tyler in the house, literally my house, beach house. Uh, we are here in my office shooting a quick Q&A. So let's go through find the questions. There was no topic, and you guys did not disappoint. Christian Donovan asked, how far could you toss lightweight national champion Mike Beach? Oh, my God. That depends on how good his hair looks that day. Well? <laughs> a quarter mile. <laughs> Here's a serious question. Uh, Jeff Milliron, cleats or spikes for rotational events. Uh, personally, I don't know, a lot of people go back and forth with the cleats. I do the javelin boots. A lot of people like high jump spikes because they have spikes in the heels too, like javelin. But for me, they're the perfect length. And I'm, I'm, I'm okay. I'm pretty good. Mm. Spikes. Uh, for me, I tend towards spikes. Uh, I don't come from a true track and field throwing background, so me, I mean, the rotation of my feet having a constantly turning right is something I have to pay a lot of attention to. So I feel like a cleat bites too much, and if I'm a little off, it can cause me some problems there. I, I actually just use straight up track spikes. I've tried a few different ones. I like the track spikes. There's no spikes in the heel, which some guys don't like, but I try to stay off my heels as much as possible. Uh, but when it's super muddy, um, cleats are a good. I mean, you almost have to. When you've got bad conditions, bad track, you have to go with the cleats. Mm -hmm. um, also, well. In my opinion, Spencer. Throwing in Scotland cleats. Take take soccer cleats yeah. with you. Look at what the guys who throw really far throw. Mm, big red brus. Oh, a lot of people have asked me this. Uh, what's wrong with your right foot and the world record heavyweight for distance throw? <laughs> well, if you look at the picture, my right foot's pointing right at the camera. Uh, that's, that's not the case. You want to get your foot turned more towards the trig, try and get your hips ahead. It's kind of a chronic problem I have. And it's been so long driving that it's really hard for me to get that thing around fast enough. So I have to crank like a son of a bitch when it actually hits the ground. But that's it. You want to get your toe ahead of your hips. Or hips ahead of your shoulders with your toe hips. Foot. Nailed it. Foot was wrong. Yeah, um, I'll counter argue by saying it was a world record so nothing was wrong with it. <laughs> How's that sound? <laughs> Got Boomer asking. I want to go fast, but I'm fat. <laughs> What's the best way to generate? Welcome to the fucking club, buddy. <laughs> What's the best way to generate speed in the weights? Against a conventional wisdom, I'm going to answer first here. Be less fat. Try that one out. Um, never a bad thing. It tend actually worked for Mr. Tyler here. Mm -hmm. He dropped a few pounds. All of a sudden, got a little bit faster. Got a little bit uh, able to move through the trig a little bit better. Um, but for, but for, <laughs> but for being faster while fat, I'm going to turn it over to the world record holder here. Yeah, uh, when I was mega turbo fat, uh, I got up to like 375 a few years ago, just kind of gave up and had a lot of fun eating with my wife when she was pregnant, and it sucked trying to move fast. So I feel your pain. Like, you never lose the vertical leaping ability. I could still jump high when I was super fat, um, but rotational speed really suffered. And Peach is right, try and trim up some. But other than that, I mean, you have to do speed work. Period. Any kind of linear speed work is going to transfer into your rotational speed. Um, we talked about it earlier using different weight implements too. If you're a little more experienced, um, if you've got a few years under your belt throwing, using lighter implements to work on developing speed can really be helpful. Uh, use lighter stones, lighter weights, lighter hammers, that can help a little bit. But there have to be some fundamentally sound things going on already. Your positions have to be good already for that to be the case. That's why I say if you're newer, that shouldn't be your primary concern. Primary concern, like Spence said, trim up a little bit. Right, and to what he said, if you want to work speed with lighter implements uh, and you're fairly new, kind of chill with that until you really have a technically sound throw. Because if you start just trying to work speed and go fast, you're going to you're gonna piss away a lot of progress you've made just hitting positions. Yeah, you'll develop bad, fast habits. Right. <laughs> All right. Ooh, here's a good one. What's your favorite Alanis Morissette song? Mm. This is karaoke. Mm -hmm. uh, will you learn it for karaoke? Karaoke, no. I've never sang it in my life and I never will. Wait, what was the song? The song. Oh, yeah. Favorite Alanis song. Alanis? Alanis? Alanis, let's say. She's, she's Canadian, so I think it's going to be Alanis. Shit, I can't remember. I had that record, everybody did. 
her, Garth Brooks, and Nirvana. That's yeah, all you needed. Jack, Jack, Jack and Little Phil, man. <laughs> Shit. Uh, God, I don't know. What was good other than Ironic? Ironic was pretty solid. Um, she had some sad ones that were pretty good. You Ought to Know, the first single, pretty rocking. That's probably my favorite. Yeah, that's pretty good. I, you know, I got to go with a, with a deep cut on that one. I got to go Head Over Feet. I thought that was a lovely love song. Good job producing that one. Glenn you, you Ought to Know is the one where she's like... Uh, and now you think out of me when you fuck her. Yeah, like, yeah, like no, yeah. You're getting a blowy in a, in a movie. <laughs> did, yeah. you know, did you know that song was about Uncle Dave from Full House? Really? She dated uh, Dave Coulier. Cut it out, guy? Yeah, that was him. That whole song was about him. She also dated like the Ryan Reynolds guy, too, huh? Yeah, I think he's, he gets around. He's a real slut. He's a fucking hunk. Gosh, he is, a, he is a dime piece. Those abs and chests. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this one's from Neil Warden. Probably applies to both of us. What do you do with your kids when, you, when you're lifting? Like, you know, we both train at home with some regularity. What do you do with your kids when you're lifting? Oh, man. Eva, she wants to lift bad. So she likes to hang out with us. And we have 8 by 16 our single, we have three car garage, so the single car stall is an 8 by 16 weight room. It's a sweet setup. And the other side is Eva's little area to kind of just generally fuck off whenever we're lifting. And she also tries to mimic a lot of the lifts. She spends a lot of time swinging on the rings. She's always there with us. And Olivia, my wife, OH, Liv, Tyler on Instagram. She's she's pretty rad. Check her out. Mm -hmm. uh, she works out with Eva all the time. Eva loves it. So she's there with us. Nice. She's a savage. She is. She's uh, <laughs> she's two. And I picked her up. I hadn't seen her in, oh God, it had been six months or something like that. Yeah. I hadn't seen her and I picked her up and it's just like, oh, she's just dense. Like she looks like just a normal proportion two-year-old kid. She's tall and big, but she's just dense. She's got some some genetics there that just make it. She's gonna be a freak. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I got two little ones. I got a seven-year-old boy, three-year-old girl, and I got a, a new baby that's being born tomorrow. Tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow. Um, so right know, now, possibly. Yeah, it could be. I should go check. But uh, I, yeah, I have I have the luxury of sometimes training at a CrossFit gym, and at that CrossFit gym they have a kids area, which is huge. And I think you're seeing a lot more gyms that are going that direction, realizing that if you just give people a, at least a place with air conditioning to put your kid for a little while, it's fine. You know, we'll, we'll let them stare at a screen for a little bit or eat snacks or whatever it takes during that time. So that's pretty cool. And when you ha surround yourself with people that are in that mode, that helps a lot. When I'm at home, I mean, look, you just have to get used to the idea that you're going to get interrupted. And this kind of plays into the whole philosophy of how I go about lifting weights. And I think everybody in our circle of friends approaches it. There's nothing holy about you lifting weights. There's nothing sacred about it. It's important and it's therapy for you but it's part of your life and so are the other people that are in the house and if they want to come out and be a part of it or they want to tell you what they're working on or what they're doing whether it's my wife it's a kid anything like that take the time and stop and talk to them your next set of squats is not that important you're going to get to it there's going to be time so it's not really a matter of what do you do with them or how do you get them out of the way it's how do you integrate it into your life you know and my goal and i think spencer and olivia's goal is too is I want my kids to see me do that stuff. I want them to see me pursuing that, pursuing a goal, trying to win, trying to become better, trying to improve every day. I want them to see the importance of lifting, training, being a better athlete, being a better human. I want them to see that day to day. I want that to become like a second nature thing to them to where it's not like, ooh, you work out with a barbell, you're really unique, where that's just, yeah, that's what you do to keep your body tuned up. So that's, I think that's my answer to it. It's more about just integrating it into your life instead of trying to separate it out. Mm-hmm. What? <laughs> All right, Keegan Dillon, would you consider yourself a love child, a love child of Matt and Andy Vincent? <laughs> no. No love involved in it. <laughs> I'd have to be a little shorter, have a deeper voice. Mm, my eyes would have to be closer together. Mouth smaller. Smaller mouth. I'd have to be able to hide behind a dollar bill. That's Matt. <laughs> And Andy's too much of a hunk, so clearly there's nothing happening there. Uh, he is. I'll probably just put a picture of Andy up over the rest of the Q&A. <laughs> so just look at him while they're listening to us. I'm going to try and find a picture of adolescent Matt Vincent. <laughs> that's going to be great. I don't think he knows I have this picture. Oh, man, that's beautiful. Oh, <laughs> uh, let's see. Ty asks, how long have you been throwing Highland Games? You have a throwing background. Uh, I've been throwing Highland Games for right on four years, four and a half years, something like that. 
Uh, I did not have a throwing background per se. I, uh, I was a baseball player all the way through high school, so the idea of throwing and generating force with my hips out to an extremity is not a new thing to me. I was a pitcher, so that made some sense. Uh, I was a fencer through college, and I fenced for about a decade after that with some weird dream of going to the Olympics. And uh, so the footwork and stuff kind of came along uh, quicker, I think, for me in Highland Games, and it all came together. But, you know, I was kind of in a try-everything, powerlifting, strongman mode, you know, five, six years ago, and I just kind of stumbled into Highland Games because of Matt and Andy, and ran across this knucklehead because he lived close to me, so that's kind of what led to it. You don't need a throwing background to do this sport. You don't. There's plenty of successful people that don't. Sure, it gives you a head start. It helps, but it's not necessary. I mean, it's it's a sport. It's a thing you learn. You just have to be more patient if you don't have thousands of hours of training with throwing. It helps. All uh, right, I Damian Fisher. Damian. Uh, he said your right foot is close to touching down before your left comes off during your sprint in the weight for distance. Is this intentional? No, but especially in the heavyweight, I mean, it's fucking heavy. <laughs> so I, this whole year, and anytime anybody asks what I did different, I spent a lot of time working on one turns and really focusing on driving off this right leg. So when you push, 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 and get a really long, hard, strong push, uh, it tends to stay on the ground a little longer than, than I want it to. But Seems to be working. Is it ideal? No. I'd like to get off of it faster, just like in stones or, or, or if I was throwing discus, you can get off that left foot as quick as you can. But yeah, no. But it's it's working, I guess. Uh, Hayden Balio, the pirate captain, wants to know what was your biggest poop ever, and more importantly, what is your next Highland Games? Are you talking to you? Yeah, both of us. Uh, biggest poop <clears throat> when I was coaching at Lago Vista. I went in weighing, I went into the potty weighing 312, I came out weighing 308. Oh, PR. A four pounder. It was pretty serious. I was beaten by, I still don't fucking believe this, I think he had like a water bottle in his pocket or something, <laughs> Tinsley. He went in weighing, I don't remember what he weighed, I just remember the difference was seven and a half pounds. Oh. How is that fucking possible? That's a child. How, how much do you think you guys were sweating out though while you're on? Like, no, you no, 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 <laughs> no. This is walking into the bathroom weighing. We have a scale right now. No, I'm saying door. sweating while you're on the shitter though. Oh, uh, well. <laughs> it could be a pound. <laughs> he also came out naked. <laughs> <laughs> but that was pretty typical. Nice. <laughs> um, so your next time on games, when are you competing again? Uh, next weekend, Enumclaw, Washington. Nice. And then I have a whole month of August off. And then the big month starts September with all the awesome games I mean they're all pretty awesome but but the big hitter games like Port uh, not Portland but uh, Pleasanton Celtic Loon and uh, asked if Estes if I can get in Peggy Again. <laughs> uh, for me um, biggest poop ever I don't know lightweights don't poop everybody knows that so efficient uh, when is my next time in games I'm actually not throwing again till September 17th like I mentioned I am having a baby tomorrow so there'll be a new bar running around. That's going to be my focus for a little bit. I'll continue to train. I'll continue to post all the stuff that I can. Uh, make sure you guys are seeing that. But it's going to be some time off. And some of that, even if I didn't have the baby, there's not a lot going on in Texas in the dog days of summer. So, and that, even if there was, I probably wouldn't throw one because it's 103 degrees in the field. Ugh. So, uh, but I'll be throwing it September 17th in Charleston, uh, Charleston Highland Games. That'll be a good one. There's going to be some good athletes on the field. Uh, I'll throw with the Super A group there. They don't have a lightweight class, but I'll throw with the Super A's who get lumped together with the pros. So that'll be a nice little test of... Where? Uh, uh, Charleston, South Carolina. Oh. Uh, Frazier's going to throw in that one. Mm. Uh, Frazier and Wes Kaiser, the pros. That oh, one. Wes is the best. Yeah, Wes is a good dude. I like Wes a lot. Thor asks... Thor, you're so fat. Um, Spencer, why are you so dreamy? Good genes, I guess. Yep. Have you seen my mother and father? Good night. They're in their late 60s and they look like they're in their early 60s. They, 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 <laughs> no, my, my parents are seriously, they got lucky. I'm not, I know that's a joke because I'm no dreamboat, but uh, I actually do think I've held up pretty well for the beating I put on my own body. Yeah, well, your, but, mom was a, your mom was a basketball player, right? Yeah, she was a old school three on three in Shiner, Texas, home nice. of delicious beer. But uh, yeah, no. Other than that, no, it'd be heavily drinking and uh, heaters. If you're throwing several weekends in a row, what does your training look like during those weeks? Uh, Jason Spragans. Spragans. Oh. If I'm throwing like in September, 
where if the schedule lines up, I'll throw every single weekend, four weekends in a row. Uh, typically, it takes me forever to recover. <clears throat> so if I have just a one-day Saturday game, holy shit, after traveling, I don't want to even look at a weight or anything to throw until Tuesday. So I'll try and lift two days a week and throw one day a week. And that's a stretch. It'll probably just be one or the other, or one day of each. But the goal is to lift Tuesday, Thursday, and throw on Wednesday on those. And that's the goal. That's the way it's been in the past. Stay as fresh as possible. Don't do anything heavy or super heavy. Ever. <laughs> Ever. All right, uh, we got one from uh, Nico. <clears throat> says, how not to suck at WAB. I believe that's impossible. I believe everybody sucks at WAB always, all the time, even the people that are best at it. They always well, that fucking suck. sucks. Cox no, WAB's awful. And look, you're talking to a guy who, um, as you know, the heaviest I ever threw at was 225 pounds. You're talking about an event where I'm not really set up for success. But I balance that out by not being very strong. Um, the biggest thing that changed for me was to start thinking of it like a throw instead of thinking of it as just a strength event. A lot of guys just set up for a pull and they're just thinking of doing, they're pulling hard. They're thinking of it as a strength event because it's so static and your feet don't move. I started making progress when I thought about it as a throw. When I think of it as a dynamic thing, when I think of that weight's traveling through space, where am I applying force to that weight? When is it passing my hips? When am I engaging my hips to make that happen? Just like I do anything else. I mean, a lot of people put a lot of technical thought into sheaf. They put a ton of thought into sheaf and they just throw that out the window for Wob. And it's a lot of that, those same principles are there. I mean, the, the transferability of the things you do with the Olympic lifts, snatch pulls, clean pulls, all that kind of stuff, that's all there in Wob. And if you think about it as a throw and how the power you're developing transfers to that, I guarantee you're gonna do better. Yeah, I totally agree. <laughs> the heart of a gypsy girl. What have you done differently in the past six months to a year in training to break up, to break multiple world records? Well, I made it a goal, like I wanted to break some more records. That was one big one. But Beach and I were talking about this earlier, and I've answered this to a lot of people. I always try and cut weight in off-season this, this year. I just said, fuck it, I want to get strong and see how strong I can get. And that was the biggest deal. First time in my life I've put numbers on a board, weightlifting and powerlifting numbers that I wanted to hit. And I, some were lifetime PRs, some were just, you know, post 30 PRs. And I hit every single one of them this year. Yeah. And holy shit, feeling strong again is, it's the best decision I've made in the past four years. Awesome. Do you feel like the bull semen had anything to do with it? No, it, it was, it was more of just a topical thing. It's, true. it's recovery. Yeah, I put else. it in right between the elbows. It's good. It's smart. It's smart. You can keep it the whole day that way and apply it when you need it. It's not milk. Uh, Columbus Jones asks, how do you throw the weight for distance when your hands are too fat to fit in the rings? <laughs> you fucking quit. <laughs> <laughs> That's really the answer to almost any question. If it's, re if it's really too difficult, you just need to quit. You quit. You quit. <laughs> the only reason Spencer has made it to the elite level is he hasn't hit anything hard enough yet to where he needs to quit. But the second he does, I guarantee he's hanging him up. No. If it gets too difficult or it's not fun, I'm <laughs> done. Uh, I find that if your hands are a little too fat to fit, that applying a little bit of cheeseburger grease doesn't <laughs> <laughs> work. Fuck. <laughs> Just get a turkey leg, go no napkin, go raw dog on a turkey leg. I figure if you're that fucking big, that you've got that side of your package and leg cleavage. Mm. Mm -hmm. Just fucking hum your hand down in there for a little while. That's true. And just get that Fermunda built up. And that's organic. That's a pretty good, that's a pretty good loop. Did you actually die in the final season of Roseanne? <laughs> <laughs> that's fucking great. Bo Fay ass. Oh man, <laughs> fucking Bo. Dan! <laughs> uh, what's the reason you set up the way you do for ways for distance? Does it put you in a better position yeah. after the first rotation? So, the biggest problem I had in years past was fouling out the left. I still kind of have that problem. But it wasn't from over rotating, it's just because where I would land and where my energy would be going when I start driving, that's just the direction I would drive. So, well I guess it was from over rotating. So I just started slowly turning and turning and turning. And honestly when I set up the first time like that was in Sacramento because it's the only way I could legally throw one. I kept stepping on the wing trig or whatever. So I went back to training and I'd done it a couple years, a couple times in the off season and it felt okay. 
And now it just, after that, you know, adhering to a rule, it fixed my throw. So I set up that way and I do a full turn and then just drive like a motherfucker. And it feels good. Yeah. And typically, and, and I, I put up a video a while back, you know, my goal is to go from back right corner to front right corner. I want to drive as long as possible. The hypotenuse. Yeah, hypotenuse. It's a uh, hypotenuse. Hy so, yeah, the corner to corner is going to be your longest area. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm fairly tall, long legged. So the more energy I can put in a longer drive, the further it's going to go, period. So. Yeah. That's why I do it that way. You know, I don't I, know if that answered a single fucking question or not. Yeah, it actually answered two, believe it or not. All right, cool. It answered the found at the left thing and that setup thing. Uh, I talked about this on a, a previous video with Aaron George about after we watched your setup in Portland. And my number one fear was that we're going to see a lot of novice intermediate throwers just start to do that, that setup out of the back, because they saw you do that. Yeah, there was a guy on Facebook. I can't, I can't remember who it was. Just Rick, posted. Rick Flair. Rick Flair. He just posted a video doing it, and the first comment I saw was Ryan Stewart's, you know, talking about don't set up like this because you're closing yourself off. That's 100% right. If you set up like that, and your first turn lands, and your left foot is way closer to the right line than, it, than, than your right foot, then to get a linear drive, you're going to have to over-rotate on your drive. So you're turning this linear energy into rotational energy and you're losing a lot of you know potential force to put on the weight at the finish so don't do it it took me years to perfect doing that so learn it oh fuck I hate to admit this watching Matt Vincent is probably the best footwork uh, you know watching him and, and you know actually Ryan Stewart's really good too Ryan Stewart's a phenomenal heavyweight thrower but uh Matt and Ryan are great guys to watch just to get foot placement and rhythm down. And then from there on, you know, nobody throws exactly the same. You know, go that, uh, sp you know, throwing sports wide. Everybody's different. You have to understand that there's tens of thousands of repetitions and lots of throwing events between that setup and his finish that have happened already. He's already, f all the things in between them have already gotten to such a level that those adjustments will start to make sense. If you don't have all those things in the middle, if you don't have the other 99% of things, changing your footwork isn't going to make anything good happen. It's going to probably mix you up for longer. I mean, there's a lot of guys like me that were not track and field guys, and we learn from watching. We've learned on our own. Uh, we learned from having training partners. I was lucky enough to throw a Spencer when I was early on, like we were training partners for a while. But you learn from watching, you learn from a little bit of coaching. There's not Highland Games coaches out there. Uh, you know, some of us just teach ourselves from YouTube, and I see a lot of guys come to games and they're trying the things that they've seen. And I'm never going to knock you for that. I'm never going to make fun of you for that, because at least you're out there, you're doing it, you're trying. But you have to think about when you're watching the best. You know, when you're watching like a Harrison Bailey, when you're watching, you know, an Alistair Gunn, when you're watching um, a Ryan Vieira, you have to understand what's gone into them getting to those little quirks. Master the basics first, just like anything else. All right, I'd also like to point out that uh, for the past couple questions, there's been a three-year-old uh, in the house screaming her head off, and neither of us even batting an eye or stop. That's, that's veteran parenting right there. <laughs> she likes to party. Daddy's trying to be a YouTube star. It's not working. Not working. Awesome. That's oh, Nikki Kahanic. I, I don't want to... Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Best ass in the game. <sighs> Robert, Robert Knievel named it. There is no fucking, there's no question. Chuck, it's, right? it's Chuck Casson. Yeah, it's Chuck. It's Chuck, show me that ass Casson. Oh is, my god. It's like a shelf. I'm going to take a bite out of that thing. Oh, my mom asked a question. <laughs> I like that one. Sandy <laughs> Tyler with a question. When did you first pee in the potty and not on the floor? About 15 minutes ago. I was about to say, up top. Cool. All right, well, if you want to find Spencer, tell him, Spencer. Spencer J. Tyler at. Instagram. <laughs> Is that your email address? <laughs> Spencer J. Tyler at Instagram.com, guys. And then, of course, just look me up on Facebook. I have a YouTube, S. Tyler5757. It's pretty lame, but I'm working on it. Yeah. Hey, and I'm proud of you. Well, thanks. Yeah. It means a little. Yeah. Thanks for doing the Q&A, Spencer. Uh, I guess we're probably going to go drink some more. I'm going to drink some more fancy sparkling water, and then I'm going to kick Spencer out of my house. Mm. I'm ready to go. You fucking idiot. <laughs>
Oh, I thought that was full. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't know that it wasn't. Threw it down like a hard dick. 